Hello everyone, I am Ranindra Pumshigeva, currently an apprentice in Data and Materials Department of Sri Lanka in the Civil and Commercial section. So today, I am going to help you all who are anticipating to sit for the final year examination in Sri Lanka Law College to decode company law part of commercial law one subject. So when considering the commercial law one subject, 50% uh, of the syllabus is consisting of company law area whereas the other 50% is consisting of the law of partnerships, law of insurance and law of agency. So even though there is a 50-50% split in the syllabus, when it comes to the question paper, 75% out of that question paper is from the company law area whereas the other 25% is from the other areas. And also if you take the past papers from previous 5 years about, uh, you can clearly see the first compulsory question which carries 20 marks out of possible 100 uh, has always like mostly been from the company law area. So these are enough and enough and good reasons why you should be well versed in the company law area to be able to pass this subject in order to pass the final year examination successfully. So, uh, before uh, moving into the contents of the subject, uh, I would like to give a small explanation what is actually being expected out of this question paper. Because when you uh, study also, you might feel it, maybe it's easy, uh, some people. Uh, and also when you look at the question paper also it seems like the questions are pretty straightforward and it looks easy and answerable and people after sitting for the examination often come out of the exam hall thinking that they have scored really well for this subject but that is not has been the case always in the past years. Uh, it's because this subject, the examiner or the lecturer uh, is not expecting you to parrot out the uh, lessons that you have learnt in the class, you have learnt in the lecture in your answer booklet. Instead, they are giving you practical scenarios, they are giving you problem questions where you have to think like a lawyer, think like a legal advisor who is advising a corporate company and then you have to apply those, you have to apply those rules or those and laws uh, in a pragmatic approach to the given scenario. So if you do that really well, only you will be able to get good marks for this subject otherwise you will just get a random pass mark and that will affect your average a lot uh, okay so now I have given you an overview of the paper overview of the syllabus and overview of uh, what is expected out of you in the examination and before moving into the deeper concepts and technicalities of this subject, I would like to give you a small introduction on uh, company law uh, application in Sri Lanka. So, so, you should know firstly that there are five types of businesses in Sri Lanka. Uh, those are sole trade businesses, partnerships, private limited companies, public companies also known as PLCs and companies limited by guarantee. So sole trade businesses are businesses where a single person has formulated a business by using funds from his own personal funds or by acquiring bank loans. Whereas partnerships is a business where uh, two or more than two people gets together, brings in property into a business and they share a profit uh, in a ratio which they have agreed upon in the partnership agreement. 
and private limited companies uh, companies are uh, businesses where people have invested money and in return to the invested money they have they are getting shares uh, in proportion to the money which they have invested and also uh, one of the key features of private limited companies is these are limited liability companies that means when the company is in debt uh, the li the shareholders are only liable uh, to the amount of unpaid amount on their shares so these are the features of private limited companies and these private limited companies are controlled by shareholders and directors and bureau directors there will be manage will be a management and employees who will be implementing the policies that the board of directors and the shareholders have taken in their meetings and uh, the difference between the public li private limited company and the public companies is private limited companies can't raise their capital or can't raise their funds uh, by using the general public they can only use private fundings of their shareholders uh, private fundings only but uh, public companies they can uh, raise their capitals by way of uh, issuing shares to the general public by listing themselves in a stock exchange and the company limited by guarantee are companies who are mainly uh focused on educational and charitable objects and they are not envisaging on profits uh and why they have been given the name the company limited by guarantee is when the company faces an emergency situation uh the people who have uh guarantee the guarantors of this company who have guaranteed to provide a certain amount of money in situation of emergency only we provide that amount of money which they have been guaranteed upon so these are the main five types of businesses existing in sri lanka so for our syllabus for our examination what is important is to know about private limited company mainly and uh, also while discussing that it is very important to discuss about the type of legal personality the companies are having in sri lanka so you might have studied it from your civil procedure laws that uh, in sri lankan cases in litigation only two types of personalities are been recognized so first thing is uh natural persons and the second type of persons is juristic persons natural persons are normal people like you and me but the juristic persons are people who are identified as a person in the eyes of law or by law so these can be group of people or a body corporate and they are given the identification as a person by law so according to the companies act of sri lanka under the section 2 all the companies who are registered in accordance with the companies act are considered as body corporate and these corporate bodies have the ability to be sued and to sue on the uh, by their registered name so then the companies have a uh have a companies are a juristic person so now i said uh the companies are controlled and managed by managers and employees upon uh, policies made by the board of directors and some and sometimes shareholders uh by their decisions they are taking in uh, the prospective meetings so now where does all the procedures have been laid down for a company have we ever wondered so now let's say uh, all the mechanisms of a country 
uh, and all the framework and the rules how a country should be governed is uh, put down in the constitution. Uh, there are different different constitution written and unwritten constitution and etc. So mainly it's a document called constitution. So also likewise a constitution is there for a country for a, a company there is a similar kind of a document which is known as the Articles of Association. So, Articles of Association puts forward the provisions for the domestic regulation of a company. That is the internal regulation of management and administration of the company and also how a business should be conducted uh, in a company has been uh, laid down. The provisions for those have been laid down in the Articles of association and uh, the shareholders of a company usually makes out and approves these articles of association. So a company according to the section 13 of the Companies Act, a company could may provide for any matter uh, in these articles associations but it should not be inconsistent with the provisions which have been laid down in the Companies Act. And the articles of, the, of a company can provide for the objective of the company, the rights and obligations uh, of shareholders and also uh, how the management and administration of a company should be done. And also under section 14, uh, any company can adopt the uh, model articles which have been put down in the first schedule uh, to the companies act but uh, companies limited by guarantee does not have that option of adapting the model articles and section 15 of the companies act gives the opportunity and lays down the procedure on how you can how a company can amend uh, or adapt articles for its articles of association so a company can just 15 of companies that slates down the procedure on how you can adapt, how a company can adapt and amend uh, the articles of association. So in accordance with the provisions of the Companies Act and the articles of associations, with a special resolution a company can adapt articles and if a company has articles uh, which are different from what, the, what has been given in the model articles and if a company wants to adopt an article from that, those model articles then that can also be done by way of a special resolution and also a company can amend the articles by way of a special resolution as well and such an amendment or such an alteration uh, uh, must be given uh, notice of such an alteration and amendment must be given to the registrar of companies within 10 days. Now you know that there is an articles of association which lays down the regulatory framework of a company and how you can amend that and what kind of things should be uh, should be in included in the Articles of Association and that sorts of things we now have discussed. So what is the ultimate with the effect of these Articles of Association? So Articles of Association have mainly four effects. Uh, the articles are the articles of association are being constituted con are being constituted as a contract between the members and the company. Also, it is considered as a contract between a member and the other members. And the third thing is, third effect is, uh, the articles uh, grant rights and imposes obligations on the shareholders in their capacity as members. And also, members can rely, cannot rely on uh, their rights in their capacity as outsiders. Now, what does this mean? Now, articles grant rights and imposes obligations on the shareholders in their capacity as members. So, if the article states that if there is a dispute between the company and the member, 
and it should be resolved by way of arbitration but then it should be resolved by way of arbitration those are the rights that are being granted so you can't in a situation where there is a dispute between the company and the shareholder you can't without exhausting the uh, procedure of arbitration you can't straight away go to the courts because that has what has been agreed on articles of association by the company uh, between company and the members however there cannot be any articles uh, in the articles of association which states that the articles are unalterable and there cannot be any separate contract also which states that the articles are unalterable and uh, there cannot be any provision in the articles of association which requires a three-fourth majority for uh, approval of any resolution so these are the effects and these are what should be done and what cannot be done in articles and uh, we have now discussed how articles of association are being made and what uh, should be included in articles of association how it can be amended and what are the uh, provisions in the companies act which facilitates amendment and uh, adoption and also we have discussed the effects of the articles of association and also the provisions if included in articles of association which are white and uh, let's move forward to another two uh, situations important situations how a company can take decisions so under section 144 uh, you get the option of resolution in lieu of meeting so usually a company takes decisions in meetings where all the shareholders take part and the annual one is we call as annual general meeting and usually there can be other other uh, meetings uh, in accordance with the emergencies which rise time to time in a company and when there is a need of a, uh, making of a important decision so however this name itself actually gives the explanation the resolution in lieu of meeting that means a resolution instead of a meeting so this resolution is something which has been written down and so you should know how these resolutions in lieu of meeting are becoming valid uh, so for them to be valid there are certain conditions that should be fulfilled so first thing is these resolutions must be in writing and the other thing is these must be signed by uh, signed by uh, not less than 80% of the shareholders of the company and those share 80 not less than 80 percent of the shareholders has to have 85 percent of shareholding of the company that means these shareholders this all the shareholders should have 85 percent of the shares of the company as well so if this a uh, number of uh, is this number of if this number of shareholders with who bears the respective percentage of shares uh, have signed a resolution in writing this would become uh, a this would become a validly made decision in the company and also if these conditions are fulfilled and in the in this kind of a situation if a decision has been arrived by a company then it is also can be considered as similar to a decision which has been taken in a general meeting of shareholders so uh, and the next type of uh, decision making which we can observe in companies which, uh, but not in all types of companies but in private companies uh, are unanimous shareholder agreements Section 31 of the Companies Act is applied for unanimous shareholder agreement under Sri Lankan law. 
so the conditions that are, that has to be fulfilled for these unanimous shareholder agreements to be valid are uh, firstly the company should be a private company and the second should be the share all the shareholders should agree in writing so if these conditions are fulfilled then these uh, decisions are becoming valid and uh, these decisions can be taken in relation to any matter in respect of that company even though in the articles of association or the provisions of the companies act companies act has laid down anything contrary to this uh, situation so the section 31 subsection 2 has put down few situations that uh, this unanimous shareholder agreements uh, can be a uh, unanimous shareholder agreements are applicable and first thing is uh, issue of shares by the company and the second is this when a company is making a distribution and the second is the repurchase or redemption of shares in the company and the fourth is the giving of financial assistance by a company for a purpose in connection of purchase of shares by a company and the fifth situation is a payment of remuneration or a loan to a director or any conferment of financial benefit or any other benefit on a director and the sixth is uh, when the company is entering into a contract with an interested director so section 31 subsection 2 puts down these these situations where a unanimous shareholder agreement is applicable so now uh, if we uh, uh, again uh, make a, a small recap of what we have discussed so far we have discussed the types of businesses existing in sri lanka we have uh, discussed the structure of a company in a, in a, in a, in, a, in a overall manner and we have uh, looked at what uh, what articles of association means and the effect of articles of association and the articles uh, which are uh, void uh, if we put in to an articles of association and we have discussed what should be included in articles of association and we have discussed two types of situations where a company can make decisions the resolution in lieu of meeting and then the unanimous shareholder agreement so now uh now the decisions are always be made by the majority as we have seen even though if we take a simple majority if we take a special majority or a solution like a meeting or an unanimous shareholder agreement all these are uh decisions made by the majority and this is how a country is being run and similarly a company is running also based on the decisions of the majority uh but however uh now people the shareholders who are opposing these uh, opposing these decisions are also have invested their money into these businesses so what the duty of the corporate governance the role of the corporate governance and the purpose of company law is always to strike a balance between the minority shareholders as well as the majority shareholders so uh, in order to protect the minority shareholders or shareholders of the company uh, the shareholders inherently gets the right to uh, to make uh, uh make personal actions for the for the infringement of their personal rights and then representative actions as well when the when a one single personal right of a group of shareholders has been infringed and that is there and however there can be uh, other situations uh, which we are going to uh, discuss uh discuss uh where the 
shareholders personal rights are not infringed but then there is a need for the shareholders to go to courts uh, to tell that they look here that there is something wrong happening in the company uh, company by the people who are in control of the company and the wrongdoers are the people who are in control of the company so in such a situation the remedies that are available under company law we call them as uh, shareholder remedies and now uh, now we explain uh but first of all uh before moving into the shareholder remedies before moving into the explanation of what are shareholder remedies and how it has come forth in the evolution of company law or evolution of uh, corporate law uh, i should first explain the majority rule principle this majority rule principle has been laid down in the case of foss versus harbottel in the uh, british law what has happened in this prosperous capital rule is there have been some irregularity happening in the company so as a result of that two shareholders had gone to the courts uh, to make an application against the wrongdoers the directors of the company but what the court has uh, what the court has uh, said was uh, if a company is wronged the proper plaintiff who should come to court on behalf of the company is the company itself and by telling that they have uh, dismissed the application of those two shareholders they have dismissed the uh, claim of those two shareholders so and from that case they have come up with two important rules in uh, company law first thing is the proper plaintiff rule and the second thing is the majority uh, rule principle the proper plaintiff rule is just as in the decision of that case if an alleged wrong has been done to the company the proper plaintiff uh, of that should be the company itself and the majority rule principle is is this if uh the alleged wrong is an action which can be ratified or which can be confirmed by a special majority of that company that the court is not going to intervene so under these rules the shareholders are uh, devoid so under these rules the shareholders are devoid of the opportunities to go to courts for any irregularity which is happening in the uh, in the company so uh, now the thing is even though the court says the comp for a alleged wrong which has been done to the company the proper plaintiff of that application should be the company itself now the company is not a natural person it's a juristic person and whenever there is a matter coming up for or on behalf of or against that company then who who is going to represent the company in court is the board of directors but if the same board of directors who is who is supposed to go and represent the company in the courts are the wrong doers itself then the law at that point clearly understood that there is a loophole in this law and this should be circumvented prevented so for that the law brought in uh, exceptions to this first versus arbitral rule and these exceptions are uh, given under common law as well as uh, under statutory schemes so under common law Uh, the exceptions are where an act complaint is ultra virus then the shareholders can go to courts against that action and the act 
is something which can be only satisfied by a special resolution uh, by a two third majority then the shareholders can go to courts to make an application and also if the transaction the alleged transaction is infringing the personal rights of the shareholders the shareholders gets the right to make an application to the court and also if there is a fraud happening on minority by the wrong, by the company and then again the mine uh, the shareholders gets the opportunity to go to court and make an application and the statutory schemes uh, which have been laid down as exceptions to the Foss versus Harbottle rule is uh, the actions against against operation and mismanagement under section 224 and 225 of the companies act and seeking for interview uh, seeking for restraining orders and derivative action and minority buyout which, which is a new concept that has been brought into the company law under the 2007 amendment of the companies act so then we will move forward to discuss in detail what are these uh, shareholder remedies so when talking about uh, seeking for restraining orders the section 233 of the companies act is applicable so uh, a director or a shareholder or shareholders can make an application to the court to seek a restraining order so the court can order a restraining order against a company or a director who proposes or which proposes to engage in a conduct so now from the from this provision itself you can understand that these restraining orders cannot be obtained for actions which have been completed but these restraining orders can only be uh, only be made uh, for actions which are pending completion and also uh, another uh, important feature of this restraining orders is uh, uh, the applicant party uh, can uh, apply for an interim order uh, uh, without waiting for the uh, matter to be fully heard uh, by making an ex parte application and by giving notice for the respondents and also respondents without waiting until the end of the case to be fully heard they also can make an application to the court to uh, for, the, for a revocation of such an interim order or for a variation of such an interim order so you have to remember section 233 is uh, is laying down the procedure uh, of seeking and seeking a restraining order and restraining orders can be applied by a director of a company or by a shareholder or a group of shareholders and the court can make an order of make an order of restraining against a company or a director who proposes to uh, uh, engage in a certain conduct so these are the important things that you should know about restraining orders and the next shareholder remedy is the derivative action and the derivative action is there where the shareholder is exercising for the benefit of the company for alleged wrong against the company and when the wrongdoers are in control of the company and why this derivative action name had been given to these action is uh, the shareholders have derived the right to make an application on behalf of the company from the right of the company to uh, act for the wrongs which are committed to the company so that's how the derivative action name has been given to these types of uh, actions 
so uh, in the, according to the common law the sri uh, in sri lanka there are only three limited situations where you where a shareholder can bring in a derivative action uh, one is when there's a fraud happening on the minority and the wrong doers are in control of the company which makes it impossible for the company to uh, make an application on behalf of the company also when there is something illegal happening in the company then the shareholders can go and make a derivative action and the third thing is the failure to approve a matter with a requisite special or uh, extraordinary resolution uh, as appropriate and these remedies the shareholder remedies are equitable remedies so there are three preconditions that should be fulfilled before going into courts so what the first thing is one who comes to court must come with clean hands and the second thing is the actions must be there for proper purposes and the third thing is the third precondition is that uh, no other means of redress should exist so if these preconditions are fulfilled and if these uh, if the reasons for a derivative action are limited to the ones which i have explained earlier then yes a shareholder is good to go with the, good to go with an action of derivative good to go with a derivative action and the beauty of the sri lankan derivative action is which has been uh, explained under section 234 of the companies act is that not only shareholders under sri lankan company law the directors also can make an application to the court for a derivative action and the other uh, and the other two uh, shareholder remedies are the actions against oppression and actions against mismanagement so under section 224 of the companies act the actions against oppression has been described so let's say uh, there uh, let's say there is uh, the conduct of the company is happening in such a way which is oppressive to the share oppressive to a shareholder or shareholders of the company so if in such a situation a shareholder or shareholders of a company can make an application to the court under the actions against oppression so uh, what amounts to oppression has been uh, not given in the section itself or in the companies act but in different different times in different cases it has been decided as uh oppression amounts to harsh and wrongful actions and it can also be persistent disregard of the company's act articles of association and such and such and under section 225 of the companies act uh comes the actions against mismanagement so affairs of a company which are being conducted in a manner prejudicial uh to the in prejudicial to the interest of the company and if there are material changes happening in the company which amounts to the changes of board of directors uh, agents uh, company secretaries and changes in the constitution and control of the company and changes in the body corporate who acting as the Uh, 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 acting as agents and secretaries of the company, and the ch- the, if there are changes in the ownership of the shares, and by reason of such changes, if it is likely to be seen that the conduct of a company is going to be conducted in a manner prejudicial to the interest of the company, then a shareholder or shareholders can go to the courts to make an application under Section two hundred and twenty five. uh which is against mismanagement so even though uh, the sec- the these two sections 224 and section 225 says a share a shareholder or shareholders can go to courts the section 226 explains exactly uh what amounts and who what amounts to a shareholder 
so here a shareholder means uh, it's a group of people who should have uh, not less than 5% of shareholding or a group of people uh, who consist of not less than 5% of shareholders should be there to make an application and by the mutual consent of the of the group of shareholders one shareholder can go and represent all the rest of the shareholders in a uh, action in the court and also uh, for these uh, these actions uh, joint shareholders are considered as only one shareholders but however if the court finds out that these actions have been brought in without any proper uh, purpose and proper cause and these have been brought in vexatiously then the court can make an order to uh, uh, to prohibit uh, this respective shareholder of being appointed as a director or manager or a secretary of this respective company for at least about uh, for, an, for, an, for a period not exceeding 5 years and also uh, he can be suspended from uh, his rights of for shareholder as well by a by an order of a court and uh, also moving into our final the last shareholder remedy is the minority buyout this concept i said earlier also uh, is a new concept which has been put forward in, uh, by way of uh, um, by way of an amendment in the 2007 amendment to the companies act and this gives a right to a shareholder to have their shares be bought by the company when that share, particular shareholder has voted against a resolution or a decision in a company so uh, there are uh, mainly three situations uh, which we consider here uh, first situation means when the shareholder has a right or entitled to vote to alter uh, the articles to impose or to remove a restriction on the business uh, active on the business activities which the company can engage or oh, uh, where the shareholder is entitled to vote for a major transaction to be uh, approved, uh, to major transaction to be approved uh, by a special resolution or a major transaction which is contingent on approval by a special resolution, and also in a situation where company is deciding to go to amalgamation. If the shareholder has voted against the decision, against such decision, or if the shareholder has not signed a resolution in lieu of meeting under section 144, then uh, the shareholder again gets the right of the company having to buy the shares of that respective shareholder. Under section 93 of the Companies Act. So, so section 94 of the Companies Act lays, lay, companies Act lays down the procedure uh, for the company to buy the shares of a shareholder who has voted against a resolution or vote, voted against resolution in lieu of meeting. And within uh, 10 working days of such resolution has been passed, the shareholder can make an application to the company requesting the company to buy his or her shares. So, within uh, uh, for, from the date of receival of such notice, within 20 days of receival of such notice, the company can either agree to buy those shares or arrange a third party to buy those shares or make an application to the court telling that they are unable to uh, uh, buy the shares due to several several reasons like they are financially not capable of buying the shares and if they buy the shares it will disproportionately damage the company and then if they buy the shares they would fail the solvency test 
and and they can also reason out that they had uh, given reasonable efforts to find a third party buyer but they have been unsuccessful in buying uh, finding one and if the court is satisfied with uh, these uh, uh, these conditions which have been put forwarded by the company it can exempt the company uh, from the obligation or they can the court can make an order to suspend the obligations or also the com- the court can make any other order such as including uh, setting aside the resolution and directing the company to not to take any action or ordering compensation to the shareholder as well as it can go into the extent of ordering a winding up of the company as well and if the company is unable to meet these obligations then it shall rescind the resolution or it can uh, decide to not to take any actions which have been resolved and also inform about the same to the shareholder in writing so these are the shareholder remedies so shareholder remedies if we give a quick recap to the shareholder remedies first thing is the re- is seeking restraining orders this can be done by a director or by a shareholder or group of shareholders as well and the second thing is derivative action so in under common law it's only the shareholders who can uh, make an application uh for a derivative action but under company law in sri lanka also directors can uh make an application to court uh, in the scheme of derivative action and also there are actions against mismanagement and oppression which can be taken by uh the shareholders uh and also there are minority buyout option uh, which can be exercised by the shareholders by uh properly in the company to buy the their shares for a fair and a reasonable price so so uh for in, in furtherance we'll have to look at winding up of companies director duties and conversion of public uh, companies and amalgamation uh, uh amalgamation in company lawsuits which we can discuss in another day so i think i have given you a proper overview of uh, of uh, the introduction of uh, of a company and what kind of a personality a company holds in the eyes of law and what is articles of association and uh, the effects of articles of, of association and the effect um, and how a company is taking decisions by resolution in lieu of meeting and by unanimous shareholder agreement and also the remedies available for shareholders uh, under shareholder remedies where the duty of the corporate governance or the purpose of corporate governance and the company law is to strike a balance between the interest of minority shareholders and the majority shareholders as well so i hope you will uh, i hope you have gathered uh, some useful knowledge uh, which is uh, which is uh, important for your upcoming exam and uh, and have a great period of study